Alzheimer's can get very dark. If you've seen it, you know. Um, often they've been interpreted as maybe under the influence of drugs or alcohol or just being belligerent or resistant. So 3% suffer from Alzheimer's. 10% of people are in some way affected by mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. Eugenia Preston, welcome to the Jedburgh Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having us. This is a really impactful and important episode for me, and I really thank you so much for helping set this up and welcoming us to Alzheimer's San Diego. I told you when we were doing some of the calls before we met today that my grandfather suffered from dementia, mm -hmm. and he was 89 years old. He was a, a role model in my life. He was a part of every, almost every single day of yeah. my life growing up, and I was in college when he passed away, but it stuck with me. And you know, you remember him as he was a chemical engineer mm -hmm. in the army, in the in the Army Corps of Engineers, and worked on the Manhattan Project. Yeah. And then the last few months of his life, it was so hard to see. And it's and you know, it all it will be with me those last few months for the rest of my life. And so when we were introduced and had this opportunity, we haven't done an episode on Alzheimer's or had this discussion on the Jedberg podcast. So I was. Absolutely, immediately in and very excited to come to San Diego. It's part of our San Diego series. It's episode two of that. It's also episode 99. Oh, that's cool. Right. So we another, like that. another benchmark that we're going <laughs> to we're gonna close out single digits on this episode. But thank you so much for spending some time with me. No, we're happy to have you here and always happy to raise awareness of this topic. It's so important. Well, let's talk about the topic for a minute, Alzheimer's, and I'm throw out some stats. I've been doing the research the last couple of days, but Alzheimer's... Top six leading cause of death in the U.S., California, and San Diego. It's up there with cancer, COVID, disease, accidents, and strokes. In San Diego County alone, there's over a hundred, right around a hundred thousand mm -hmm. residents, age fifty-five plus, with diagnosed Alzheimer's. But that number by twenty twenty by twenty thirty is expected to grow to about one hundred fifteen thousand. The number that I found really staggering though, is that it takes almost 300,000 people to care for 115,000. Right. And that is that I'm not a math major. That's why I studied journalism. But <laughs> that's a two, almost a 2.5 to, to 3 to mm -hmm. 3 to 1 ratio of caregiver to patient. There are 3.2 million people in San Diego County. I did this. this I did the math this morning. That's 3%. Mm -hmm. So 3% suffer from Alzheimer's, but the more important number is that 10% of people are in some way affected mm -hmm. by Alzheimer's. Why are these numbers so important for everybody to digest? I think it's really important for people to digest these numbers to see the scope. Um, and there's a few things about these numbers that aren't shown in the statistics. Um, one of the most important things or one of the biggest difficulties is people even getting a diagnosis. So when you're stating all those numbers, they're true as far as we know them to be. But we also know that it is very hard to get a diagnosis. And a large percentage of the people that we help with or work with and help on a regular basis don't even have a diagnosis of dementia, Alzheimer's, or any of the related diseases. So those numbers that you quoted are really much higher in all actuality. They're just not recorded. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's staggering is that we know that 25% of people who have a diagnosis of some form of dementia live alone. Wow. So think so about it's that. Even harder. So that's, There's nobody looking at them every right. day to even address change and identify right. behavioral change in, mm -hmm. the, in their pattern of life. Exactly. And you also talked about the fact that that's 55 and over. We hear from people all the time that are in their late 50s, early 60s that have to stop working because of this. Now, maybe they've lost their health insurance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think often people think of Alzheimer's as an older person's disease. They think of somebody who's 89 like your grandfather. Right. But when it impacts younger people, it's even much more difficult. We, I was talking to someone the other day. The husband's 52 He's the breadwinner for the family. They have children that are still in high school. He had to stop work. The wife had to go back to work. So now she's caring for teenagers mm -hmm. and her husband with much less resources and a very different healthcare package than they had before. Mm -hmm. So it just, it really bleeds into every aspect of the family life. 
you're the CEO of mm -hmm. Alzheimer's San Diego. What drew you into this type <clears throat> of work? Um, long story really short, my grandmother's the youngest of nine. I come from a really That's big it? family. <laughs> I mean, I come from a really big family. I, have three I was three kids, and I'm like, this is enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just nine. <laughs> um, I was, you know, I was around all my older aunts and uncles my whole life. I was always around people who were, you know, in their 60s, 70s, 80s from the time I was a child. My great grandmother was still alive. We cared for her at home as a family. Um, my mom worked in this environment, so you know, when I in this um, in a residential care setting. So when I turned 16, I got a job there. I really liked it, went to school. My background is health administration, gerontology, and I've worked with seniors my whole life. Um, what really drew me to uh, to begin volunteering many years ago with uh, Alzheimer's San Diego was that I have family who had Alzheimer's, you know, died of Alzheimer's disease. They were on the East Coast. I wasn't there to help. What can I do here? So I got involved with the local organization here. And uh, one thing led to another, and here I am. Now you lead it. Yeah. Preston, I want to ask you, because you're on the clinical services side of things here. I, I want to talk about the disease itself. It's a slow disease that progresses really at a, in some terms in a snail's pace, but it's one of those things where you know it, 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 the onset is slow, but then it can turn up very quickly. Sure. There's three phases early preclinical stage, no, almost no symptoms. And then you have a middle stage with mild cognitive impairment. And then there's this final or later stage. Progression, though, varies from person to person. Not everyone experiences even the same sim symptoms. People live two years, 20 years. The average, I understand, is three to 11 years. Right. What do you see in patients as they progress through these phases? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, you know, the we have a saying at Alzheimer's San Diego, when you met one person with dementia or Alzheimer's, you you met one person, right? So the, you know, the typical progression, you know, we see people who come in who are in the early stages, just got a diagnosis, they're still highly functioning, you know, they can communicate well, they can still, you know, you don't really notice these, you know, many symptoms at all until you kind of really start talking to them on a one on one level. And then, it really progresses into disorientation and confusion. Um, you know, unfortunately, they'll have to stop driving at a certain point. Um, and then, you know, I would say from a timeline standpoint, you know, early stages are kind of two to three years and there's the really long middle stages. And then, you know, once we start seeing some physical declines, needing help with what we call activities of daily living. So being able to, you know, pay bills on time, dress yourself, feed yourself, things like that, then that's when we start transitioning to kind of like the later stages, starting to see that physical toll of it. But it's a it's a horrible disease. Then again, it's really, you know, you see these common symptoms, but everyone has kind of their unique journey with it. What controls that pace of how quickly somebody progresses? Gosh, I, you know, I wish, I wish I had the the answer to that question, um, but I would say it's a myriad of other health factors that are involved with it. You know, there's some people who are incredibly physically active and they can have great physical health, but just their mental deteriorates, you know, at a slower pace. So it's just, it really kind of just depends from person to person, I would say. But, you know, the um, important factor I would just say is just, you know, if you can have a healthy heart along the way, that's going to, you know, improve your chances of, you know, living a longer t period of time. What brought you into the organization? So I was um, going to San Diego State, finishing my master's of social work uh, program. And I was in my second year internship and looking to, um, you know, really, you know, connect with older adults. I really love loved working with that population previously. And um, during my second year at San Diego State, I interned here at Alzheimer's San Diego and really enjoyed the work here. And I did something right because I got a job <laughs> offer when I graduated. So um, always a goal of the internship. Yeah, for sure. But it, it was both sides. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So but it was a great place to to learn. And I've been here ever since. One of the most frustrating parts of, of Alzheimer's is the inability to figure out the true causes. 
Right. And we've already alluded yeah. to it here, you know, uh, even a couple of times in just a few minutes. But we can talk, and some people can talk about genetics, talk about environmental mm-hmm. factors, lifestyle. When you, when you work with a patient, how important is is the cause, and what does the science say about the root cause of the disease? I think first of all, when we work with people the cause means nothing to us, you know, for how we're going to be able to offer assistance and care for them. Um, Because whether it be frontal temporal dementia, Lewy body, um, vascular dementia, any of those, a lot of the behaviors manifest the same. So it's really just coping with those things. Um, The science on how it's caused, you can find you can find it I did. being attributed I, I looked to it everything, up. There right? Everything. That's why I'm asking. Did you also find some of the cures that are out there? I mean, for every cause, there's also a, a corresponding cure yeah. that, you know. I think I think the, the, the cure is, the answer to that is there is no cure. Right. Exactly. As desperately as people want there to be and, you know, well, have you tried this supplement or that or whatever? There's just not. Um, So what our focus is, is to try to help people live the best life they can with the disease. Um, Alzheimer's can get very dark. If you've seen it, you know. But that doesn't mean the whole um, time that you're dealing with it has to be that dark. You know, you can try to have as much enjoyment as possible while you're working through those stages. You talked a bit ago <clears throat> about early onset mm-hmm. dementia. So people who are age 30 to 60. Right. Now it's a small percentage, about 5% mm-hmm. of, of, of people with Alzheimer's fall into this. But they've also found that there are demographics of people who are more susceptible to, to the disease, people mm-hmm. with Down syndrome, for right. example, certain mm-hmm. uh, ethnic backgrounds may, may also fall into that. What's the difference between these early onset cases versus the elderly? I think the one main thing is that um, we typically see someone with early onset progresses through the stages much quicker. Mm-hmm. So the younger you are when you are diagnosed, the quicker you're going to progress through the stages um, versus somebody who is older. Yeah, I would agree. I think the when we see those families come in, it's, you know, it, like we've talked about, the typical progression is very, it's typically slow, right? But then, you know, the the changes when they come, when whether it's a result of a fall or something like that, can make the changes happen a little bit quicker and just hits harder for the family to deal with. Mm-hmm. Well, I, that that I did not find. Yeah. In in trying to understand the difference between those two, so so yeah, so if it's coming on earlier, there's you're going to be right. on the shorter end right. of of the essentially the lifespan. Right. And I think one of the biggest risks. Um, Listen, we've all seen the movies where, oh, if you just talk to them this way, they're going to remember you or you do this. Or, or unfortunately, Alzheimer's is in some ways made fun of, right? Oh, it's just funny. It's this, it's that. But it's a real safety issue. People don't think about that. But somebody with um, some form, you know, with dementia, they get to a point where they can't make safe decisions, which is why they can't drive anymore. Not just because they can't find their way home, but because while they're out driving, they might not recognize they're turning the wrong way on the the road or whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that's one of the hardest things for families dealing with someone or caring for someone with dementia is that they're having to make all the decisions themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's can lead to a lot of the caregiver stress because people are wanting to wander off or may, you know, they wouldn't take their medications safely or mm-hmm. can't be left home alone. Um, and it, the safety risks are very high. I have a very good friend of mine who, both of his, uh, both of his in-laws mm. have dementia. Mm-hmm. Um, they're in their seventies, uh, but there's a full. They have full care, mm-hmm. uh, you know, twenty four seven. And there's so many, you know, there's there's so many factors that now go into that: the cost, mm-hmm. the the stress on the family, you know, because what what I found through you know, just being close to him and, and his wife is that even though they're not there caring for. Mm-hmm the parents every day, they have to manage now a staff mm-hmm. 
who's doing that. It's oh, running yeah. a small and, business. Yeah, and they, who doesn't show up that day right. and who calls <clears throat> out and now no one's there mm-hmm. and then they can't get someone to backfill it and then they can't go to work because they have to go take care of right. the parents. One of the programs that you have is is designed around respite mm-hmm. and giving this breathing room to those who do care for them. And we already mentioned that it's you know, two and a half, three to, three to one ratio for caregivers to patients. Mm-hmm. Can you talk for a minute about that program and why do we have to think about the people who are giving care and you know we want to put the patient first we want to put them at the forefront of everything Mm -hmm. but there is true mental emotional and physical strain that's put on the caregiver absolutely there's huge strain on the caregivers and it's 24 7 um somebody with alzheimer's their sleep schedule might be all mixed up they might sleep all day and be up all night if you're caring for them that makes it very difficult for you to get rest Maybe they can't be left unsupervised because they will go for a walk down the street, whatever it might be. We all need that time to ourselves to recharge a little bit. So through our All's Companions program, we recruit and train volunteers to be able to go out and provide some free respite in the home to families. So our volunteers go out and they're not doing hands-on care. They're not bathing people or taking them to the bathroom, but they're providing that break so that if I'm caring for my husband, I can go to a movie, go to have lunch with my friends, get some time to myself. But a lot of people go take a nap when the caregiver's there because they just need to be alone in a room. But Preston's been very much involved with the All's Companions program. Do you want to talk about it a little bit more? Yeah, you know, from helping manage it to also being an actual volunteer during my internship, you know, the um, it was a fantastic experience just for me to get to know this, this, you know, this veteran that I was, that I was fortunate to just tell, you know, he's able to tell his stories, you know, and that was really just awesome to hear. But at the same time, it was, you know, I spent about every, you know, my weekly visit, I would spend about 10 minutes with, you know, the care partner when she would, you know, arrive, and then she would go and then she'd come back four hours later. And, you know, even in that 10 minutes, I could just see, just the stress relief that she had when she came back, she could just go run an air and she can go see a friend, you know, and even it may not sound like that much, but when you are, you know, the most, one of the most common things I hear from our clients is they are, you know, they feel trapped in some ways because they're in, you know, they're in caregiver mode 24 seven. So the fact that they just have some time for themselves is just a gift and they can you can just see the weight kind of just you know it's not all all the way gone but it's partially gone and it's it just is such a big stress relief for them mm-hmm. i think a lot of caregivers are, are family too and mm-hmm. yeah in a lot of respects but i think a lot of times the caregivers are also the ones who are going to identify that their family member has the onset of mm-hmm. this disease can you talk for a minute about what do you look for? Like, when is what is the point at which you, know, you have this list of uh, of of you know these um, these different symptoms? Mm-hmm. You know, but what is the point at which you yourself or somebody set somebody you look at somebody your loved one and say we need to go get looked at? We need to go talk to somebody. Sure. So a lot of times people will joke around and say, "Oh, I can't find my key. I, I must have Alzheimer's." Right. It's not that you can't find your keys because we all do that. We're all busy. It's when you have your keys in your hand and you don't know what they do. Mm-hmm. It's um, So the signs to look for are people not um, sequencing things appropriately. Maybe their shirt's on over their sweater um, or bills not getting paid. Things that would have always been done religiously falling through the cracks. If you look at medication and the medication should be time to be renewed, but it's still a full bottle. Those are a few subtle things. What else, Preston? Yeah, I would say um, any sort of, you know, possible social withdrawal, you know, um, that's a big one. A lot of these things, it's important to go get tested because a lot of the early stages of and these symptoms and signs can look very similar to an untreated depression, right? Mm. But at least an untreated depression is, you know, theoretically treatable, right? So we can at least kind of pinpoint that out and, you know, get the right treatment in place. But, you know, I think it's, you know, if you're, if your gut feeling, if you're saying like, gosh, this, this is just off, they're just not the same person that they used to be, then I would say, let's go to the doctor, try to get a referral to a neurologist and kind of go from there. Right. 
And it can be hard because sometimes there's not a baseline. Right. And yeah. people, even the caregivers who are seeing the signs, don't necessarily want to hear this diagnosis, right? And so they'll try to cover a little bit too and say, well, you know, she's always been forgetful or he's always been a little, you know, flighty or whatever it might be. But there's no baseline. I mean, I really feel like there should be a baseline um, memory test, memory screening given to everyone at their doctor's office, maybe every two years once you reach a certain age. I mean, people get mammograms at a certain age. There are all kinds of tests that we do, but we don't do that with memory. And so I think if we did that, we could pick up on things sooner. That's That's just my own personal belief. (laughs) The mission of Alzheimer's San Diego is helping people impacted by dementia, fighting stigma, and supporting research. Mm -hmm. There's three pillars that you focus on, three pillars of support, education, social work, and patient care. Mm -hmm. I want to kind of dig in each each one of these for a moment. Let's start with education. You run events, you run seminars. Who's the target audience and, and what are the components of those educational courses that you're running? Sure. I would say the target audience is everyone, Um, but we have a few um, avenues to do that. So there's community education, which is the education for the person diagnosed with dementia and or their care partner. So we do have classes that are specific to the care partners where maybe the person with dementia would not be appropriate to attend. We have some where both can attend. Then we also have a lot of community education that we can tailor to specific groups. So maybe it's uh, medical professionals, maybe it's grocery clerks, librarians. We actually, a couple of years ago, did a lot of training with um, utility employees, people that go out to the house and see people in their home. We did um, training with the local cable company. So you're a, a cable employee and you've been out to this house now three times because the person says their TV doesn't work, but it's because they don't know how to use their remote. So to help make some referrals and get resources that way. And then one of the big things we've been doing a lot of and really focusing on the last few years is more first responder training. So people go out and um, respond to a scene and officers don't often get a lot of information before they get there. Right. And so they're dealing with what they're seeing in front of them. And somebody with dementia could present as um, often they've been interpreted as maybe under the influence of drugs or alcohol or just being belligerent or resistant. But trying to provide those tips and cues to recognize that maybe this is a dementia or Alzheimer's issue and to better handle the situation is that kind of that kind of training actually really fascinates me Mm -hmm. is that and i think it's critical Mm -hmm. i mean absolutely critical i mean especially i mean now you know it's it's difficult to be a first responder yeah i mean let's not sugarcoat it you know i mean it's really hard you're under the Mm -hmm. microscope yep and and i think this is really one of those this is a point of differentiation this Mm -hmm. is an opportunity for you know a first responder to really truly be trained Mm -hmm. in in, in a different way and so that they they can interpret those things Mm -hmm. because i don't i don't have the numbers on this but i'm sure that there's a, a there's a decent percentage of cases that involve people with alzheimer's mm-hmm. who are interacting with first responders is that training widespread or, or prevalent across the country or do you know it's from what we've heard it's not prevalent across the country because we've had a few grants we're currently working on a grant with the department of justice um for that training and we've been asked to speak at different conferences and things across the country and it's always been A, very well received, but B, like, oh my gosh, how do we get this? How can we do it in our area? So it's not really widespread. We've been lucky. I think that it's been very well received here in San Diego. And we're dealing with San Diego City Police, the Sheriff's Department. You know, there's a lot of different first responder entities. So it's not like you can just get to one and and, um, have the training go everywhere. But um, when we're able to get to them, they're very receptive and able to... um, make time for us in their schedule and think about it first responder they could get a call from that focuses on someone from a newborn to 100 years old Mm -hmm. you can't be a specialist in everything but being able to have the resources um we've built some really strong relationships and i never knew this but it makes sense right the computers that are in police cars can only access authorized websites 
Oh, really? Um, they can't just surf the web, which mm. again makes sense. Yeah. Um, but one of the local sheriffs saw our training as so valuable. He got permission so that they can access our website from their vehicles now because they see the value and they know that they can um, can benefit from it. We also set up a specific referral line for first responders so that they can send their referrals to a, a separate, um, you know, box and we pay different attention to those, you know, and make sure they're responded right. on even more quickly. Yeah, it's really one of those things where when you know you brought it up here and you you mentioned people look at it and they say, oh <clears> man, <throat> wow, yeah, it's like you you, know, you don't think about it, right? And then you then now that you've brought it up, you ask the question of, well, why wouldn't we do that, right? Mm-hmm. You know, social work, mm-hmm. Preston. I think this is your lane. Yes, that's what that's what you're <laughs> focused on. Can you talk about the, the the support groups and the social work that's that you're doing? Yeah, we have a lot of different. Um, services from our that are offered from our social work team, our clinical services team. Um, I think one of the best things that we have is you know when, when we're open, you know our our phones are open, so you can just call in and clients can call in whether it's looking for a resource, whether it's hey I'm just having a really crappy day and I need to talk to someone. Mm-hmm. It's just something that um, you know there's going to be someone on the the other side of the line and being able to talk to you and get that information as quickly as possible. And it's something that I think we pride ourselves on. We want, you know, there's, there's so much stress in the daily lives of our care partners. We want to make sure we can get them accurate and good support as quickly as possible. So, you know, being available to them is just really excellent, but we also have, I don't know how many support groups we have currently, but we have a myriad of different support groups throughout San Diego County that meet, you know, some of them are in person. A lot of them are because of the pandemic, we had to transition to Zoom and, you know, talk about resilience and from our care partners, they were able to adjust that pretty quickly and, you know, building that sense of community in a support group is so important. I lead, um, I facilitate one of the, support groups for adult children that are caring for their parents and just the support that they give each other you know i you know i pride myself in trying to give as much you know information and support as i can but it doesn't match the type of support that you receive from a a, another care partner who is in a similar situation and just understands it and gets it so that's just the power of a support group that you see every time and so i always encourage our care partners if they can make it to try out a support group we have just under 40 support groups going on right now um that's a a lot mm -hmm. and they're like preston said all around the county or virtual and you know three years ago we never would have thought we would be doing a lot of virtual stuff but obviously the whole world had to do that. And we thought people would be anxious really to get back to in-person support groups and some were. But the other thing we discovered is for a lot of people, the idea that they can still do the support groups virtually and they don't have to get someone to come stay with the person they're caring for Mm -hmm. so they can drive to a support group, it alleviates that other burden as well. And, um, you know, that social work support and the respite care that I mentioned earlier, that's all free. And, to get someone to come into your home to provide four hours of respite care would cost right now with the market probably $200. And for a lot of families, they couldn't, they just can't do it. They can't afford it. And even if you could afford to pay for the social work support, it's not out there in our healthcare system. Our system isn't modeled to have access to a social worker in that way. The only time we really encounter social workers in our healthcare system is if you're in the hospital and you're being discharged, or maybe if you're in a skilled nursing and you're being discharged. That's the only time. So you mentioned that the services that you provide in Alzheimer's San Diego are free. Mm -hmm. And you dug into some of the numbers here. I'll give you a couple more that I found. But the data, right, quote unquote data shows, the internet, Google shows that that $4 billion, about $4 Mm -hmm. billion in unpaid care Mm -hmm. is required for just the 100,000 that suffer from 
Alzheimer's here in San Diego County. You can do the math on that. It's about forty thousand dollars per year mm-hmm. per pa- per patient, mm-hmm. and that's at home. So that's what I wanted to ask you about. That is so. So what does insurance cover? What does insurance not cover? And and now how does the gap get covered? Sh- is, you're shaking, so I, I, think I, I think I hit a good one here. <laughs> insurance, I mean, as far as care at home, insurance doesn't cover anything. Insurance is going to cover your doctor's visits. It's going to cover um, any medications that might be prescribed that you need. It um, is going to cover if your doctor thinks maybe you could benefit from some physical therapies to prevent falls. Um that's it'll, really it'll what cover some hospice care at the at the at, very end the stage. Very it'll end, cover hospice is care. Important, but yeah, I mean, you're talking about that's one of the great frustrations and one of the I think I'll just speak on behalf of the clinical services team when we get asked that question. It's like, okay, I have Medicare, like, so what? What can I get from this? And you know, we're unfortunately have to present the bad news that it's just like, well, it's not going to really get you that much or what you're entirely looking for what you need right now so it's coming out of your pocket it's coming out of your pocket somebody's pocket it's coming out of your pocket so anybody living in an assisted living community anybody living long term in a skilled nursing they're paying out of pocket what if they don't have it you i i it's you try to you move to a different facility that costs a little bit less i guess it's just there really isn't that i mean you know we um you know it's a question that this that doesn't have a good answer and the system is not prepared for the wave of older adults who are going to continue to have this disease that's going to impact our our system we're just not prepared for that so so yeah that forty thousand dollar number you're talking about that's the cost of caring for somebody at home right so that's the cost of just general living expenses at home and maybe um, they're getting a little help in once in a while but most families they can't do that so what happens very often is someone is giving up their job Mm -hmm. to stay home or what we see a lot of time is um, three generation households where maybe instead of going to college, somebody's after high school staying and taking care of grandma. And then later, maybe they can try to go to school um, or people patching it together. We see a lot of that where the person with dementia stays one week with this daughter and then this week with this daughter. And, you know, it's it's a solution, but it's not the best because having that person move around a well, lot. Now they're having <clears throat> to absorb. The, they they need stability. Right. And routine. And creating change. Yeah. So then when you talk about moving into some sort of a care facility, that $40,000 number goes up significantly because um, any care facility, you're looking at five to $10,000 a month. Yeah. And, you know, there's... You know, every once in a while you will get, you know, through at least through Medi-Cal, which is California version of Medicaid, the state insurance. You know, there's a few things there that can help pay for some of the care in an assisted living facility or a memory care community. But your the wait list to get on first, you have to qualify for Medi-Cal, which is kind of hard to do. They've changed some of the things over the past year or so where that. Well, hopefully a lot more people get access to that. But still, you know, you, we talk about this all the time. There's this this gap between the lowest of the lowest income and the people who have all the resources in the world. And, you know, there's all these people in between who are stuck in these really difficult situations. And so you end up with people living in less than ideal situation safety wise not because anyone is being negligent Mm -hmm. or not wanting to do the best but they can only do what they can do yeah right yeah Yeah. there is long-term care insurance which is the only thing that will pay for assisted living or skilled nursing but you've had to have had the forethought to buy it early enough and then even those you know they typically last for um you know, it'll be X number of dollars or X number of months, whichever happens first. So it's not a solution forever. Mm. The third pillar 
is patient care. Mm -hmm. What is the role of the clinical care coaches when we talk about patient care? So we don't do hands-on care, but the clinical care coaches really help guide the families towards a workable care plan on how to best care for their person at home, as well as trying to hook them up with all the resources that are available. But yeah, you know, I think the, you know, the, the diff, one of the difficult things is obviously there isn't a cure, right? But we can focus on the quality of life aspect of working, you know, with this disease. And so it's important, you know, when I'm talking to, you know, because this is so individualized, I want to hear what I want to hear from the the care partners and hear exactly what's going on because and hear their unique challenges so I can you know personalize you know their care options to to what's going on in their life because you know the symptom of disorientation and confusion well disorientation and confusion is going to look different from ten different people right so it's just how do we approach that how do we personalize that to their unique circumstances in order not just to improve, you know, the person that has the dementia, their quality of life, but for the care partners as well to kind of, you know, gain their confidence so that they can address it because they all have the ability to do it with deep down. It's just, they may need a little help and a little guidance to get there. So what do you tell the family that comes in and, and is in this situation? It's, it's always, you know, I don't, I never try to sugarcoat anything. I am always honest with them about what their expect, what expectations are and just answer their, their questions. You know, it's, it's, but I always want to go back to, you know, there's, this disease can get you down but it doesn't have to be the only aspect or the defining aspect of your relationship with your person or the defining aspect of your life you know i think there's a lot of different coping mechanisms resources and support that you can plug yourself in as a care partner to feel I don't know, feeling good isn't the right word, but feeling, you know, feeling like that you can tackle it on a, on a daily basis. Right. And there are the moments throughout that are going to shine through and you're still going to see the person that you, that you love. And it's not going to be, you know, this disease all the time. So I think it's really important to kind of separate, you know, what is the disease and what is still your person. And Mm -hmm. if they're able to do that, it can, it can certainly help along the way. And that is one of the things, too. I mean, just because you get a diagnosis of dementia doesn't mean automatically that day you can't <clears throat> carry on a conversation or, yeah. you know, participate in your care. That time will come, but it's not immediate. And we hear that from people, too, that they're so nervous about telling someone that they have a diagnosis because they know people will immediately start deferring questions to their spouse. Right, yeah. Or stop treating them they like a real de- person. Dehumanize them. Right. right. And that was kind of going to be my next question is what do you, you know, what do you say to the, the person who comes in and says, I've been diagnosed with dementia? Yeah, I, it's, again, it's a challenge. But, you know, a lot of times there's, there's an underlying fear there, but I just go back to a strengths-based perspective of just, you know, looking at what they're still capable of doing because it's so easy to get into a negative mind space and think, well, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this, or I'm going to need help with this. But, you know, it's just takes a little bit of time to still realize, well, here's everything that you're still doing and you're still capable of doing, you know? And And I bet for most people, it's almost everything. Yeah. Yeah, You know, exactly. And, you know, at the, at the (laughs) onset, you know, there's people who are, you know, they drove themselves here or they are, you know, in, they, are still able to tell a really funny joke or really, or just be able to connect on that emotional level. And, you know, that doesn't go, that doesn't go away immediately, you know? And that's the thing too. There are going to be things the person can't do anymore, but let them do as much as they can. You know, don't take it away before you have to. Right. Um, You know, if somebody's still able to cook their favorite recipes or, you know, 
do the crossword or garden or whatever it is, let them, you know, let them enjoy as much as they can. What's the, what's the most rewarding part of being in these roles? I think, um, for me, when you see people leave with the burden lifted a little bit, you know, like, like Preston said, we're not going to solve all their problems because we don't have a cure. I mean, that would be the best thing and that's not going to happen. But when we're able to give them some tips and tools and things that can make their life a little bit easier, that to me makes a difference. Yeah, I would say a lot of times I view it when someone comes in, they say, well, I have A through D things that are going on right now that are really stressful and you know, I'm able to connect them with a resource or, you know, look at this big puzzle, this big puzzle that they're presenting in front of me and I can just point them in the right direction or move a piece closer together, you know, and it's, that's rewarding because, you know, they're the ones doing the hard work and they're able to, you know, everyone that I've been, the majority of my clients that I interact with, they're able to, you know, put that put their puzzle back together in a way. Sometimes they just need a little bit of support. So right. whether that, whatever that answer is and when that, like Eugene mentioned, the um, when that burden is lifted a little bit, they walk out and they say, yeah, this was not only just a useful for me and my time, right? I think the most important resource they have is their time and energy. So right. when they are, um, when they feel like, oh, this has been useful for me and I feel a little bit better, I can breathe a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Like that's just, that means the world to me. Yeah. yeah. The baby boomers are now coming into this era yeah. of their <clears throat> life where there many are gonna be affected by right. Alzheimer's. This is one of the largest population groups in America. We've talked a lot about the preparedness of the system to be able to absorb this many people are is the healthcare system prepared to absorb an influx with the largest generation in the in the country in my personal opinion no i Why? also share that opinion too <laughs> Why? um we don't have the resources in place now to handle the people that are impacted now we're talking about you know they call it the silver tsunami for a reason it's it's a lot of people yeah. coming. Um, Never and, heard that phrase. So <clears throat> it's, it's, oh, okay. It's, well, I might, it's, I might take that from you. Check it in Google. Minutes. It's there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's going in the intro of this episode. <laughs> but um, we just don't have the infrastructure. We're not set up for it. There aren't um, one of the biggest um, shortages we have is for geriatricians. And a geriatrician is a you know generally a, a general practitioner who specializes in seniors we don't have hardly any we don't have enough um i know there are entire medical systems here in san diego that don't have one geriatrician on board um it's it's serious it'd be like saying it's a hospital without a obstetrician like who's going to deliver the baby right. right um so no i don't think we're set up for it and i also think that um Again, in my opinion, this is a generation of peri of people very different from the greatest generation before them mm -hmm. who, you know, it was a generation of people who didn't buy anything until they had enough money to pay for it. They didn't finance things, um, single family, you know, marriages. Now we're talking about this baby boomer generation who's a credit card generation. You know, a lot of them have second families, don't have the same resources, personal resources, as a whole um to care for themselves so it's it's going to be interesting i mean i think the disparity in this generation is in my opinion again um very different there's going to be very um low wealth people and then very high wealth and then the people in the middle so it's it's going to be tough well but they're not but that's not going to be the <clears throat> only generation that's affected no it's going to no, be every generation kids. coming after but it's it, it's going to be the generation x and the generation y millennials yeah. who are going to have to take care, take care of this and, generation right manage the burden and they are not that <laughs> they are not necessarily prone to the same level of caregiving that the baby boomers have been 
this is, and we're talking about a digital generation. We're talking yeah. about, you know, in a lot of ways, a generation that's so very self-centered, very yeah. self-focused. Yeah. And now they're the ones who are going to be the caregivers. Mm-hmm. Well, and it goes back to those stats that you were talking about earlier, where, where the system right now is built off of, on, you know, family support, you know, not from, not from a doctor, not from any state or federal system is you, you're relying on family support to get you know to carry this and we're you know the system itself the federal system the doctor system is not it's like eugenia said it's not set up you know to get to a neurologist to get a diagnosis at least in san diego you're talking three months you know of wait and so and that's not i guess it's not too bad but that's also a frustration that a lot of families come across right and so when we're thinking about this silver tsunami and we're thinking about you know just the overwhelming amount of people that are going to be impacted i mean we're you know right now we're asking a lot from our families um to step up to the plate and provide the care that our medical system isn't providing and at some point in my personal opinion there's going to be a point where you know, these people are going to say, hey, like, we've had enough and you need to step up here. You know, we need that extra support. What are you going to do? Is that the action step? What's the action step? What's the call to action <clears throat> for everyone to, to say? We, how do we avoid the silver tsunami? Well, you can't avoid we the can't tsunami. We can't avoid it, but how do we, I mean, how do we react? Um, or re- I'll put it this way. How do we respond and not react? Because if we do nothing, then we're going to be, it's going to be reactionary. It's not going to be effective. If we prepare, and the tagline of the podcast is how you prepare today determines right. success tomorrow. Sure. We're talking about a generational issue here. Right. How, do, how do we prepare today to, for some level of whatever we define success as in handling this? So the key is going to be research, right? We have to get to a point where there's, some better treatment, better ways to help people deal with the dementia, maybe slow down the progression or um, reduce the symptoms. And as a country, we've not focused on Alzheimer's research. Um, In my lifetime, AIDS has gone from a disease that was terminal, was a death sentence to something people live with. As a country, and rightfully so, we threw a lot of money in research and focus and made that happen. I think it's an amazing thing. We have been talking about needing more funding for Alzheimer's research. I've been lobbying for it in Sacramento and D.C. for more than 20 years, but it hasn't increased. The amount of federal research dollars for Alzheimer's is so small compared to other diseases. Um and we just need to focus on that research. There's not going to be one silver bullet, just like there can't be one silver bullet for cancer because there's so many different types, but we need to have something. And the healthcare system on the other side for the people who are already diagnosed, we need to figure out what is the best way for us to spend our insurance dollars, our Medicare, our Medi-Cal dollars. Is it best... Um, to provide some extra services at home? Is it best to provide some services for people to live in a community? But there needs to be some sort of reallocation. And, you know, that's beyond my expertise. But you'll be dealing with it. But we'll be <laughs> dealing with it, yeah. And it's it's very sad. Yeah. It's very sad it because, is. so we... <clears throat> we all know how our lives changed when the pandemic happened, right? We all went from living 100 thousand miles an hour to living in our homes for a short time. And I will never forget talking to one of our families after that happened and her basically saying, yeah, my life hasn't really changed because I'm a caregiver. So I already can't go out and go anywhere and do anything. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know we have one support group participant who manages um, participating in the support group virtually by sitting in her bathroom because that's the only place her spouse won't bother her. Wow. That's the only place she can get an hour to herself. Wow. I mean, I know these are just anecdotal stories, but these are people's yeah, lives. People are living that. Yeah. They're, and they're living that every day. Mm-hmm. Ten, 10% of the population. Yep. In some way. Yep. Yeah. As we close out. On that happy note. On that happy <laughs> note. <laughs> the Jedbergs had to do three things. 
every day to be successful. They had to be able to shoot. They had to be able to move. They had to be able uh-huh. to communicate. These were core foundational tasks. Sure. What are the three things that you do every day to set the conditions for success in your worlds? Well, I know for me personally, I come in every day with, I have my plan of what will happen, but I also know that's, you know, that could go out the window really quickly, depending on who calls in that day. So I think it's just having that open mind and being adaptable to whatever situation comes across my phone or my desk that day. So, uh, and honestly, that is at times challenging, but it's also exciting because it lets me, you know, stretch my creativity and figure out what, you know, different types of support that I can give that client for their unique situation that day. Um, For me personally, I also got to find at certain points in the day, I got to find some humor in in the day whether it's related specifically to my job or you know or not you know i think it's there's laughter i think in the moment can really um just alleviate a lot of the stress that comes along with some of this work and finding the humor especially within dementia i know we had a lot of you know there's a lot of negativity towards it but there's those moments where if you can find the humor in it and appreciate some of the just the absurdities that come out with it and and la- and be able to to laugh at it it you know it takes the strength and the negativity away from this disease a lot and then also i think you know number 3 i would just say you know being able to go back after um after the day is done and, you know, set those personal boundaries for myself and be able to have that well-rounded experience, whether that's spending time with my partner, um, you know, getting that personal time in so I can, you know, kind of unwind and relax and come back to the job ready to go and be more focused, you know, have that personal time away from it is a luxury that um, I know a lot of our families don't have, but it also allows me to kind of better support them too. Um, I would say for me to feel successful, I want to know I've been able to offer a solution or solve a problem um, in some way to help somebody on in a given day, um, whether that be one of our clients or the staff or anyone but I uh, like to do that Um, to be successful to allow some time for myself for something you know whether that be going to the gym or reading a book or whatever but allowing some of that personal time because everything we do is so serious and then um, it's a successful day if I'm able to sit down and have dinner with my family and have that family time those are the things we have right we have work we have our personal health and we have our family. And so if I can do something in each one of those, it's not shooting straight, but you know, it works for me. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. So, so you, <clears throat> Eugenia, offer solutions to solve a problem, allow time for yourself and spend time with family mm-hmm. and press and be adaptable, find some humor and find balance away from the job that allows you to reset and come back. Mm-hmm. We talk in a lot of our episodes about these characteristics that are used by Special Operations Command to develop, assess, and recruit talent. I tie them into my work with any organization. Mm -hmm. Specifically, you talk about drive, resiliency, adaptability, humility, integrity, curiosity, team ability, effective intelligence, and emotional strength. And when we look to build organizations, you you need people who demonstrate this Mm -hmm. character. To do that in your in your world certainly takes each one of those mm-hmm. every single day to to combat and fight this very difficult and, and yet critical disease. There's one here though that kind of comes to my mind, and it really is emotional strength, mm-hmm. because although we need and you need to demonstrate all of those things, and caregivers do, and even patients, those who suffer with Alzheimer's, have to demonstrate so much of this. I think it comes back to how emotionally strong can you be because. You're going to have to, as you said, have some really dark days Mm -hmm. that you're going to have to go to sleep and wake up the next day and be ready to combat it again. 
and fight for those good days Mm -hmm. and be on a high those good days and don't diminish them and then prepare yourself for the next difficult day and understand the challenge that faces you and your family and those who suffer from it so i really do think about emotional strength and i think that you really are are, we need to think about and and revere all those who are involved in some way with combating this disease and i think that's why it's so important for our team to have each other to rely on because other people out in the world don't really get the calls or understand and that's why the support groups are so important everybody walks into a support group with a situation that they think they're the only ones dealing with it and they walk out with five (laughs) other people saying they've dealt with exactly the same thing Mm -hmm. and it makes you feel better yeah yeah you know one thing i when when i was you know reading those um those nine um traits that you that you were talking about and effective intelligence was one that Mm -hmm. i res that i resonated with and honestly i'm going to borrow that when i'm working with my clients because it's you know we talk about how do you build your support system as a care partner right and how do you you know you're going to be dealing with the these quote unquote experts in all in a lot of different ways, whether that's social workers here at Alzheimer's San Diego, a bunch of different healthcare providers, social workers and other organizations that you're working with. And, you know, you want to rely on that expertise to get that support as best as possible. But what I always tell my clients is, you know, you are the expert in the person that you're caring for. Yeah. And if you mm-hmm. don't um if you are afraid to n- n- not push back on something that's when you're communicating with your support system that just isn't a right fit you're going to set yourself up for failure mm-hmm. so when i'm talking to my care partners i tell them like you know you have you know your person better than anyone else and a good support system is going to be able to adapt to the challenges and unique situations that you're facing. So don't be afraid to be that advocate and push back and say, hey, I understand, doc, that this medicine may be the, how it usually, how this usually works, but I'm seeing something that is just not working at home with this. Can we change it? Right. And that's how you should, and a good doctor or a good social worker should be able to come back and say, oh, okay, well, let's try this now. Yeah, you have to be an advocate for your person for sure, and for yourself as a care partner. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mm, this thank has you. Been really eye-opening. I've learned so much in the last couple of days studying more about Alzheimer's, learning from you today, and I look forward to continuing to spread the word. And we'll we'll be directing as much traffic as we can over to you, and uh, wish you the best success. Great. Thank you so thank much. You. We appreciate thank you so your time. much. Yeah. American Jedbergs went out to form the foundation of the United States Special Forces and the Special Activities Director to the Central Intelligence Agency. Thanks for listening to the Jedberg Podcast. I'm your creator and host, Fran Rochopi. Join us next week for a new episode on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on YouTube for full episodes, highlights, and other behind-the-scenes content. If you like what you heard, give us a like and leave a review. Follow me, Fran Rochopi, Talent War Group, and our sponsor, Jersey Mike Subs, on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Send your comments and inquiries to media at talentwargroup.com. As a former member of Special Forces, the Jedberg Podcast donates a percentage of all proceeds to the Green Beret Foundation, supporting America's Special Forces and their families. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow.